Good afternoon, everyone. Well, welcome to the last highlight seminar of the year. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, um, I am asked to remind you to silence your cell phones. And then um, this talk is being recorded. So um, at the Q&A session, please wait for the microphone. Um, and then um, our next seminar, a uh, highlight seminar, um, is going to be given by Robbie Diamond from Securing America's Future Energy. This is an NGO in Washington, D.C., and that's going to be February 22nd. It's a pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker, Seth Darling, who is the director of the Institute of Molecular Engineering at Argonne National Lab. So for those of you who were at the Wilhelm Lecture, sponsored by the Chemical and Biological Engineering Department earlier this fall, um, you heard from Matt Terrell, who's also the director of the Institute of Molecular Engineering, but that's at the University of Chicago. So this institute is, is a partnership between Argonne and University of Chicago, so Seth is Matt's counterpart at the National Lab. Um, Seth received his PhD in physical chemistry uh, from the University of Chicago, and then proceeded to do a postdoc at Argonne National Lab, and has, has been there since. Um, I first met Seth earlier this year at um, uh, the Department of Energy's Basic uh, Research Needs Workshop on Energy and Water Nexus, where he gave a talk. It was an inspirational talk on um, these oleophilic sponges that he had used in collaboration with uh, the U.S. Uh, Coast Guard to, to clean up oil spills. Um, so I hope he's going to tell us a little about the progress of that, that project, because I thought that was super interesting and highly relevant to what we do here. So with, without further ado, Seth. All right, is the microphone working? You can hear me okay? Good. All right, this will be a very uh, non-technical talk, so hopefully uh, the post-lunch sleepiness uh, won't be too much of a problem. So I thought I'd start just by uh, giving everyone a one-slide introduction to Argonne National Laboratory, since not everyone is necessarily familiar with it. So Argonne National Laboratory is actually the oldest national laboratory in the United States. It was created <coughs> right after World War II. Uh, we are located outside of the city of Chicago, and it was created by Enrico Fermi and colleagues after the war to develop peaceful uses for nuclear energy, hence 1946, right after the war. Um, it is in the 70 years since that time, evolved into a multi-purpose laboratory that tackles all kinds of challenges that are part of the Department of Energy mission, um, although there is still a significant nuclear energy uh, uh, program there. Um, and in fact, the technology that is used in most operating nuclear reactors uh, can be traced back to Argonne. So uh, we're located on a quite a large site, which you can see kind of faded out there in the background. Uh, it's convenient to have such a large site because when we need to build a new facility, we don't necessarily have to knock something down like many uh, urban campuses do have to. Uh, we have over 3,000 folks working at Argonne, roughly half of whom are, are technical staff doing research of one kind or another, and we operate on about uh, three quarters of a billion dollars uh, each year. So that's Argonne. Uh, in my group, um, we kind of work in a, a few different areas. We jumped around a lot over, over time through my career. Um, in the early days, we did a lot of work on kind of self-assembly and pattern formation, uh, just from more or less a fundamental science uh, perspective. Moved for a decade or so into solar energy, and we did a lot of work in that space, both from a materials perspective, doing organic photovoltaics and a little bit of perovskite photovoltaics, but also uh, life cycle assessment of photovoltaic technologies and even economic uh, models for solar energy. So kind of a diverse uh, set of work in solar. Um, about, uh, I guess, seven or eight years ago, we developed a new materials synthesis technique called sequential infiltration synthesis, or SIS. Uh, and I'll actually describe what that is a little bit later because we're using it these days for water, although it uh, turns out to have applications in lithography and optical coatings and uh, all sorts of other things. Today the subject uh, is water. Uh, and before I tell you about some of the work we're doing in water, uh, I thought it would be good to spend a little bit of time motivating um, why we're so interested in water and why we think it's such an important problem. So I'll spend a few moments uh, convincing you that water is invisible. It's actually hidden all around us right here in this room. And let me explain what I mean. So if you take 683 gallons of water, that would allow you to grow six pounds of alfalfa hay. 
And if you take those six pounds of hay and put them into a machine that looks like this, it will give you one gallon of milk. So one gallon of milk doesn't look very large, but it represents almost 700 gallons of water. And it's not just milk, it's all food. A grape, not a bunch of grapes, a grape, is about a third of a gallon. A walnut, about five. A potato, more than seven. A cup of coffee, and not a big latte like I had this morning, just a cup of coffee, is about 37 gallons. If it were a latte, it would be much more. I already explained dairy is very water intensive. So for example, a Greek yogurt is about 90 gallons. And the most water intensive food is meat, especially beef. So one hamburger, for example, is over 600 gallons of water. But it's not just food. I know there's no food in this room. But <laughs> there are other things in this room. And to make things, you need water. If you want to make steel, you're going to need water. One pound of steel, which is a pretty small piece of steel, will take roughly 11 gallons of water. And you can look at any raw material we use to make stuff. None of it can be made without water. So what that means is that the phones that are in your pocket, the clothes that you're wearing, the cars driving by on the road, all of these things represent enormous amounts of water. It's in everything. This is called virtual water. There's, of course, not literally 40,000 gallons of water in your car. Miles per gallon would not be very good if there were. So we need water for everything, not just the obvious stuff like drinking and bathing and so on. So where do we get our water from? Well, there's a lot of water on Earth, truly a phenomenal amount, but 97% of it is salty water in, in the oceans. And that salty water is not usable for making steel or growing alfalfa hay. Only 3% of the water on Earth is fresh. That still, though, is actually a lot of water. But let's drill into that 3% of water that is fresh and see where is that water. So the majority of it is locked up in places where we can't get at it, ice caps, glaciers, et cetera. So that's inaccessible water. Most of the rest is under the ground, in the groundwater, in aquifers. And we do access that, and we access it in a very large way. It is one of the primary sources of water for agriculture, both in the United States and around the world. So we're growing a great deal of our food using groundwater, and that's being used unsustainably. So we are withdrawing water from most of these aquifers much more rapidly than it is being replenished by Mother Nature. The levels are going down. This is happening in the Ogallala Aquifer, for example, in the American Great Plains. And ultimately, that is not sustainable, and it will disappear. Now, you may not even notice, but there's actually a little sliver left in that pie chart. And that tiny little sliver is all of the lakes and rivers on Earth. That's all the fresh water on the surface of the Earth, is that tiny little sliver of a very small sliver of the amount of water on Earth. So it's truly a tiny percentage of this otherwise very large resource. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so the supply is very small and getting smaller because of how we're using it. What about the other side of the equation? What about demand? Well, unfortunately, there's challenges there too because demand is actually going up. And it's projected by the year 2050 that the world's demand for water will be about 55% higher than it is today. That's in part because of population growth, but also because of just development. I told you, you need water for everything. If you want to make cars or phones or air conditioners or even electricity, you need water. And so as the world develops, per capita we use more water, so demand is going up. This is pretty much unavoidable. So we've got diminishing supply, rising demand for a truly irreplaceable material, arguably the most important material on Earth. So that's a huge problem. It's been recognized as one of the largest risks we face as a society. So Every year, the World Economic Forum gets together and identifies the greatest global risks that we face as a society. And they produce this chart where one axis is the likelihood that this risk is going to be a huge problem. And on the other axis is the scale of the impact of that problem. So if you're in the upper right quadrant, that's seriously bad news. And you'll notice, maybe you can't read it, but the one circled in the solid blue box there is water crises. So this is actually identified as one of the single greatest challenges that we're facing as a society. And a number of the others, which I have in dashed boxes there, are affiliated with water in other ways. So large-scale involuntary migration. As water resources disappear in one region, that is going to lead to large-scale involuntary migration. So it's a big challenge. And a lot of the solutions to this challenge have nothing to do with people like you or I. It has to do with you know, fixing leaky pipes and 
you know, uh, more efficient farming techniques and so on. But there are a lot of ways in which scientists can make an impact on this challenge. And one of the great ways is in materials, developing new materials to increase the supply of water that's available to us or to make our use of water more efficient in general. And there are lots of different ways in which this can happen. Today, I'm just going to give you a few examples from my own group's research in the area of membranes and sorbents. But I thought it was important to lay it out that it's just part of a much broader landscape uh, of opportunities here. So, uh, almost everything I'm going to show you involves, in one way or another, one, one of these two techniques, atomic layer deposition and this thing I mentioned earlier, sequential infiltration synthesis. So let me just give you a very quick primer on each of those techniques for those who are not familiar with them. So in atomic layer deposition, you have some kind of a substrate. Here I'm just representing it as a, as a flat surface that has a finite number of reactive sites on it, which here are just represented as little holes on the surface. And what you do is you expose that substrate to vapor phase molecules, which here will be just represented as these red pyramids which are designed to react with those reactive sites. So that vapor will flow over the surface, and those reactants will react with all those reactive sites and no more, because they can't react with anything else, so it's self-limited. You could flow it over the surface all day long. No more would deposit on the surface. Now, the cool thing about atomic layer deposition is that reactant A here, the first precursor, then provides a site for a second one, which will react with everywhere on the surface where there was reactant A. And that completes one cycle of atomic layer deposition. One cycle of A and B conformally coats a substrate with a single atomic layer, hence the name of an inorganic material. And what's really cool here is that reactant B is designed to provide a, a site to react with A again. And so you can cycle A, B, A, B, A, B, and build up layers on top of one another, each one being self-limited, one atomic layer at a time to conformally coat surfaces with great precision. SIS, which is the technique that, that we invented at Argonne, is related to atomic layer deposition, but it's qualitatively different in a way that I'll describe here. So in this case, we're dealing with a substrate like a polymer film. And if you were to do, you can do atomic layer deposition, ALD, on a polymer film. So you would, you would pulse in a little bit of reactant A, sort of millisecond scale pulses and millitor, so not very much vapor purge it out with something like nitrogen and then a little pulse of B, and you could decorate the top surface of a polymer film this way with something inorganic, like an inorganic oxide. But if you operate in a different regime where you increase the pressure by an order of magnitude or more and the time by an order of magnitude or more that the surface is exposed to those vapors, instead of just decorating the surface, it'll have time to diffuse down inside the polymer film. Because remember, these are vapor phase molecules. And if you design your chemistry right, you can have binding sites on the polymer chains that will have an affinity for that first precursor, for the A. And that will allow you to grow bulk inorganic material inside a polymer film. So in SIS, we're growing bulk inorganic material, diffusion limited. We're not decorating the surface. Important qualitative thing to understand, because I will show you examples of ALD and examples of SIS. Uh, and uh, getting them confused can, can lead to confusion. Okay, so what is an example of something that you would do by SIS? The kind of fruit fly reaction is to grow aluminum oxide in a polymer like polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA. So in this case, reactant A is trimethyl aluminum, and reactant B is just water. And the carbonyl groups are the primary uh, affinity site in PMMA for trimethyl aluminum. So that'll uh, bind in a way that we've actually spent a long time analyzing with in situ infrared spectroscopy and so on. Uh, and then water will come in and complete the reaction and grow aluminum oxide. And just to show you that you can, in fact, grow bulk material here, this is a cross section of a thick PMMA film. So I'm a nanoscientist, 500 nanometers is thick. Uh, and this is an elemental signal of aluminum uh, going into that film so that you can see that aluminum oxide has been grown two or 300 nanometers into that film. And again, it's diffusion limited, so you can play with the depth at which you grow the material by changing temperature or pressure or other things uh, that are obvious knobs for diffusion. Okay. So to water then, how do we use these things for water? So we'll start with membranes. Membrane industry is a huge industry, many billion dollar industry and growing. It's a 
uh, uh, enticing opportunity to treat water with membranes, especially if you can make them more efficient or more selective. But there are some big challenges in the world of membranes. One is that they tend to have low permeability. Not a lot of fluid goes through. I mean, you're designing them to be porous and block something. That's the whole purpose of a membrane. And so there's going to be an energy cost to push things through. Often, commercial membranes have a huge distribution of pore sizes. There are tiny ones and big ones. I'll show you some images a little bit later. Uh, and that means they're not very selective in filtering out the thing that you're trying to filter. And a universal challenge, not just with membranes, but in fact with pretty much any component in a water system, is fouling. Stuff sticks on the surface. And it can be biofilms, it can be organics, it can be scaling, all kinds of things can get stuck on the surface. And it's particularly a problem for a porous material like a membrane because those foulants plug up the pores and then it doesn't work anymore or you have to push harder. So what happens today is if you have low permeability, well, you just push hard enough to get your stuff through. And there's, of course, an energy cost associated with that. If your pore sizes are uh, very diverse and stuff's getting through that you don't want to, say pathogens, well, then you can do things like multiple pass filtrations. And of course, there's a big cost associated with that as well. And fouling, what that means is that inevitably, before long, you're going to have to clean those membranes. You're going to have to either pull them out, uh, clean them ex situ or clean them in situ, or just replace them altogether. And that is also a huge cost. Now, uh, when you want to talk about membranes, you have to uh, specify the size range you're interested in because they're actually very different from one another. Membranes are used to filter out big macroscopic stuff like hair and dirt and whatever, stuff you can see with your eyes, um, all the way down to the tiniest of things, ions, like in desalination. And they're very different materials that are used in these different uh, classes of membranes. The size that we focus on primarily in my group is this range right here, kind of roughly the ultrafiltration regime. And the reason is that that's where there's the greatest need for some innovation in the membrane space. Reverse osmosis membranes are pretty awesome already at desalinating seawater. There are some challenges with them with chlorine tolerance and so on, but they work really well. And for filtering out big stuff is not hard. I mean, just a screen can filter out big stuff, so there's not too much need there. But this range that's kind of at the scale of molecules in the nanoscale, molecules and pathogens and so on, is particularly challenging. The commercial membranes in that space are, are not good. So let me just show you some of the ways in which we're trying to combat these challenges. So let's start with fouling. So here's an example, and I won't go into any of the technical details. I'll just show you the result of uh, an attempt to use atomic layer deposition to impart uh, fouling resistance onto a commercial membrane. So this is a commercial polymer membrane, just like you would use to filter stuff that, that you buy off the shelf for next to nothing. And that is a drop of crude oil that's on the surface of that membrane. So membranes are often used in oil water separations. Um, they're a nice way to separate oil and water, but they, uh, they tend to get very fouled by oil, which then renders them uh, no longer useful. And you can see that here in this video. So we'll just dunk that membrane uh, in the water, and you'll see that the oil uh, is not going to like it. It will just stick on that membrane. You can try and scrape it off, and it's not going to be necessarily foul. Uh, so by engineering the interface, though, you can get this to happen. This is the same membrane modified by the layer deposition. So it still functions just as well as a membrane. But you can see now the oil, it's highly oleophobic. You put that thing in the water and all of the crude oil just immediately leaves the surface. So very easy to clean or even to prevent the fouling in the first place. Now this isn't quite fouling, but it's another example of uh, making a more resilient membrane with this kind of interface engineering strategy. Here we do this with SIS instead of ALD. And the resistance we're imparting here is to solvents. So membranes are also often used in environments where there are solvents present, sometimes in water. And if you take a uh, commercial polymer membrane like this one here and dunk it into an aggressive solvent that I think is chloroform, you saw what happened. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty bad result for a membrane. It was basically instantly gone. I love that video. Uh, so you don't want that to have happen. So we, now we take that exact same membrane and we do SIS on it. So now we're going to penetrate those uh, polymer fibers with inorganic material, which has solvent resistance. 
And you can see you can now take that same membrane, put it into the same solvent, and it survives just fine. Now, that was a quick dip, to be honest. If you'd left it in there, it would eventually dissolve. But in most cases, you're not dealing with a situation where you're sitting in pure solvent either. Usually, you're dealing with dilute solvent situations, and the lifetime can be dramatically extended, extended this way. Now, those are kind of passive resilience. But what happens when the, the foulant gets on the surface and it, say it's, a, for example, a biofilm that's living there? What do you, can you have active degradation of foulants? And, oh, yeah, question, go ahead. Yeah, this is, a, this is a physical protection mechanism. That's right. So it, ha it does other things to the membrane, too, some of which are actually also beneficial, but uh, not addressing that. Thing. OK. So if you want to pick a, a material to break things down catalytically, titanium dioxide is a popular material to turn to. It has lots of advantages. It's non-toxic. It's cheap, already manufactured on a large scale. It will be stable in water and so on. The challenge with TiO2 is that if you want to activate it, you need to excite it with uh, more energy than its band gap. It's a wide band gap semiconductor, more than 3 eV. That's ultraviolet light. And so for some applications, this is fine. But in many applications, ultraviolet light's a, a no-go, especially if you want to talk about, for example, developing world application. You would love to be able to use visible light and ideally sunlight to activate your, your uh, catalysis. And you can do that with titanium dioxide uh, by doping it. And so in this case, we've got here an ultrafiltration membrane. This one is ceramic. And we're going to coat that with atomic layer deposition. Now, I didn't say it explicitly, but one of the nice things about ALD is that it's conformal even for non-line of sight uh, deposition. So even a tortuous thing like a membrane, those precursors will find their way through. And you can decorate the entire membrane with a coating this way. And because you're just doing an atomic layer at a time, you're not, you're not clogging up the pores unless you do many, many cycles. And you can see by eye that this thing absorbs visible light when you coat it with doped titanium dioxide. You don't need a spectrometer. Obviously, the color has changed. Here's the, the spectroscopy if you want to see it. So before, if you just use normal titanium dioxide, it only picks up absorption when you get into the ultraviolet regime. But now we're grabbing the violet into the blue region uh, with this nitrogen doping. And it works. If you take one of these membranes and you provide it with organic molecules as model foulants and expose it to sunlight, simulated sunlight in this case, just normal titanium dioxide, you see no degradation of any kind because there's just not enough UV light in a solar spectrum to have any measurable activity on this time scale. But uh, uh, you can see the ones with the doped uh, titanium dioxide are quite effective at degrading those organic uh, foulants. We also have taken uh, sort of related strategies by en en engineering the interface using a different strategy. So this one's actually not ALD or SIS. It's a third way to engineer an interface, which is called uh, muscle-inspired chemistry. So muscles, like the creatures, muscles that live in the, in the sea, uh, they're very good at attaching to things, like boats. And the way that they do that is uh, using a polydopamine-like chemistry. And people are now adapting that chemistry to modify other interfaces intentionally. It's a beautiful, powerful, and strong. Uh, so it's a very rigorous attachment. It's also very flexible. You can put all kinds of different chemistries on interfaces that way, including on membranes. Here we've uh, used it to put on some iron uh, catalyt catalytically active nanomaterials, which participate in a photofenthin reaction. Photofenthin involves hydrogen peroxide being present also. But you can see you can also, for example, in these photographs, uh, readily degrade um, organic molecules with visible light again. OK. What about permeability? Well, I've only got uh, one slide on this, but uh, we were happy when we saw this result. It wasn't an intentional one. So this is that doped titanium dioxide again. So this is a, a plot here of the flux of water that goes through this membrane as a function of the pressure that you apply, the transmembrane pressure. So of course, flux goes up when you increase pressure. And the light blue here is the performance of the, the starting membrane. Now, we're doing ALD on this thing. So we're narrowing the pores in a controllable way, but we're narrowing them. You would expect flux to go down, because it goes as a power of the radius of the pores. But you can see in the red here what happens 
is we see a dramatic increase in the flux of water going through this membrane once this coating is on it, counterintuitive. If you continue to put more and more cycles of ALD and you constrict those pores enough, eventually it will drop down below where you started, but only when you've really seriously narrowed the pores. So you can get a dramatic uh, reduction in the energy cost to push a fluid across this membrane this way. And you can see in these dynamic contact angle videos why that happens. So here we take two of these membranes. One, we do ALD of titanium dioxide, not doped. And the other one, we do the same number of cycles of doped titanium dioxide. So they've been constricted the same amount. And it was the same membrane to start with. And you can see when you put it on regular old titanium dioxide, that droplet of water does get imbibed into the membrane. But it takes, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds for a droplet that size to be pulled into the membrane. You'll see the contrast on the doped one here. So it, we've made this thing super hydrophilic with this nitrogen doping. Now that, yeah. So, so yeah, you don't have a static contact angle because you're dealing with a porous thing and the water is getting. So you uh, you can plot angle over time and then extract curves from that. I'm not showing any of that data here, but obviously, the hydrophilicity has been dramatically uh, increased which translates into enormous energy savings. Now, the mechanism behind that is uh, light-based, not surprisingly. Um, so you can't take these measurements in the dark. We actually have been trying to figure out how to do that, so if anyone has any ideas, I'd be curious. Um, but we're taking a video here, so we need to have light. And the light, because we've got uh, the dopants, the band gap is now accessible to visible light, that's creating charged species, which we believe are the origin for this super hydrophilicity. Okay. What about pore size? How do you control pore size? So these are some, just three different examples of commercial polymer membranes to give you a sense for what they look like down on this scale. There's huge variation in pores. There are super little tiny pores and then there are giant gaping ones. Big distribution in pore sizes. So the strategy we're using here uh, uses materials that many of your faculty are expert on, block copolymers. So the current kind of fabrication flow is this way. We, Start with just a flat substrate, something like silicon, and we deposit on it a block copolymer that'll form, self-assemble into cylindrical domains, and we orient them so that they're perpendicular to the substrate. Now, that is not a membrane, it's not even porous, right? What we do is we lift that film off once we've gotten that assembly to happen, and we'll place it onto a membrane, because this film is very thin. We're dealing with, you know, 30-ish nanometers, maybe 50 nanometers, just a few tens of nanometers. It needs mechanical support if it's ever going to function like a membrane. So we'll place this onto some kind of macroporous support. I'll show you some examples in a moment. And then we do SIS. Now remember, SIS is a bulk process, not a de deposition on the top. And what we're going to do, cool thing about block copolymers is the chemistry, of course, is different in the two blocks. And so you can design it such that the growth only happens in one of those polymer phases and not in the other one. So we can selectively grow in the matrix around the cylinders and then just etch out all the organic. So there's no organic left in the end and you're left with an isoporous where all the pores in principle are the same size inorganic membrane. And you can imagine one could make that out of all kinds of different materials. So that's all a cartoon. Just to show you, you can in fact make such films. There's an SEM of top view of one such film where you can see the pores all are more or less the same size. And the size here is in that range that is quite a challenge for commercial membranes, that sort of nanoscale size. What's cool then is we did SIS to make this. You can now turn to ALD and overcoat that membrane to tune down the pore size to be whatever you want with precision. And you can see that here. Just by increasing the number of ALD cycles, you just narrow down all those pores by the same amount. You could, in principle, close them all the way off, which we've almost done here. So this allows you to design a membrane where all the pores are the same size and they're all exactly the size that you want. And if you doubt if these things can actually be made at scale and put onto another membrane, if I zoom out further, you can't see the pores anymore. But this is one of those meshes, so only about a 30 nanometer thick block copolymer derived membrane placed on top of, in this case, an anodic aluminum oxide membrane. So these dark circles you see are the underneath pores of the macropore support, and on top of it is this oxide membrane, and we can cover, you know, square inches with this thing. Um, and you can put it on even more challenging 
just about anything. And they'll serve as the functional uh, selective layer on top of something that's providing the mechanical support. Okay, let me shift gears from membranes to zorbins now. This is the part that you asked for. Okay, so our initial motivation for zorbins comes from this, from oil spills. Oil spills happen all the time. From my youth, one of the ones that sticks in the memory is the Exxon Valdez spill, which happened off the coast of Alaska in the 80s. Devastated that local ecosystem. Cost more than $6 billion in cleanup. There is actually still oil on the seafloor from that spill. That was 1989. So anyone who tells you that this oil disappears quickly, not so much, and of course it depends on the, the local environment. That's a particularly bad environment for getting rid of oil. But that, as big as that oil spill was, it was actually not in the world of oil spills all that big a spill. So in my further view, there was a big spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the Ixtoc 1. So this was offshore operations. That spilled 140 million gallons. So that was way, way larger than the Exxon Valdez spill. And obviously the cleanup effort that, that's in, I believe, 1939 dollars, 1.3 billion. So it's still a lot of money, not quite the same scale, because a lot of it was just left, uh, left for Mother Nature. You all remember the more recent gigantic spill, Deepwater Horizon, also in the Gulf of Mexico, which was over 200 million gallons, and has so far cost $61 billion. That's some serious money. Turns out that's actually not the largest oil spill in history. Does anybody know what the largest oil spill in history is? It was an intentional oil spill during the first Gulf War when the US-led forces were moving in and the Iraqi forces were leaving Kuwait. They basically just opened the spigots into the Persian Gulf. And no one knows exactly how big this spill was, but it's estimated to be more than twice as large as Deepwater Horizon. So that's a pretty absurd amount of uh, oil into a natural ecosystem. There's no cleanup cost because there was no cleanup. Um, so that you can imagine what that must have done to the, the, uh, the Gulf. Okay, so what do you do when you have an oil spill in a body of water? There's basically three tools available today. You can try and skim the oil slick off the surface, scrape it off basically like you would chicken fat off a soup. The most common technique that's used is the one in the middle there. You burn it, um, which does get the oil off the surface, but as you can see, it also creates a massive air pollution problem. Um, so that's not ideal. There was just another spill in the Gulf of Mexico what was that, a month or two ago, and that's exactly what they did, they burned it. Uh, and the other technique, which you might remember from Deepwater Horizon, was they'll fly planes overhead and dump chemical dispersants on the slick on the surface, and what that does is it breaks it up into little droplets, and it goes down into the water column. And they say, problem solved. Of course, that's not problem solved. That oil is still there. The logic is that microorganisms will eat it up uh, if you break it into little droplets more rapidly than if you, if you leave it on the surface. And it won't affect things like seabirds if it's on the surface, if it's not on the surface. But of course, it wreaks havoc on that ecosystem before those microorganisms get around to eating it up. Huge amounts of oil are down in the water column. This is us intentionally putting it in the water column, but a lot of it ends up there anyway. As the oil on the surface weathers, the more volatile components evaporate, the oil goes down as it gets denser. And also a lot of it just starts down there. Remember Deepwater Horizon had those underwater shots of the wellhead just spewing clouds of oil up into the water, a lot of that never comes to the surface. It just stays in the water column. It's kind of an emulsion. So huge amounts of oil are down there in the water column. And there is no technology available today to clean them up. There's just nothing you can do about it. So that was actually the task that was given to us by the Coast Guard, was to clean up oil in the water column. And we'll get to that, but let me start with surface oil. So our idea was to try and make a material that could soak up oil, either off the top of the water or out of the water column, a so-called oil absorbent. Now there are materials that are used commercially as oil absorbents. By far the most common one is polypropylene, usually manufactured in things like pads or shredded into things like those socks. Uh, there are some other materials, most of which are not really used commercially, but have been studied at the R&D stage. Uh, by the way, this polypropylene was used in Deepwater Horizon. They threw everything including the kitchen sink at Deepwater Horizon. They use a lot of socks like this. They soak up, soak up oil with them. And you know what they do with them after that? They burn them. It's not necessarily any better than just burning the oil on the water in the first place. Because now you're also burning the polypropylene. So 
all of these organs, though, suffer from one or more of these drawdowns that I showed here. So first of all, the oil that you've soaked up cannot be recovered. That's, for example, why they have to burn those, those socks. So that's lost. They don't soak up very much oil. They have low capacity. Many of these materials, not polypropylene, but many of the others are expensive. So they're not scalable to actually clean up a big spill. And most importantly, they're not reusable. That's why you soak up oil and you burn. Wouldn't it be nice if you could soak up oil, get the oil out, recover the oil, and then reuse the sorbent so that you don't have to manufacture, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of tons of this stuff because you can manufacture enough and just keep reusing. So, what we wanted to do was to make a sponge, like a kitchen sponge that could do what I just described. And the material that we start with, you're all sitting on right now, it's polyurethane foam. It's used on a huge scale globally today. It's in furniture cushions, it's used in insulation and all kinds of other things. It costs next to nothing. But polyurethane foam does not do what we want it to do. If you plunk down a polyurethane foam on an oil water mixture, it'll I'll show you what it'll do, but it basically just gets some oil and some water. It's not very effective. So what we need to do is to change the chemistry at the interface of all the pores that make up that foam to make them love oil and hate water. And the way we do that is a two-step process that starts with SIS. So that penetrates all of these little struts that make up the foam with in inorganic material, aluminum oxide is one of our favorites, but we've used others too, zinc oxide, for example. And that is not because aluminum oxide or zinc oxide have the properties we want. What it does is it provides uh, powerful attachment points for the next step, which is a silanization reaction, where we can attach silane molecules to the surface very robustly, which have tail ends having the property that we want, in this case, oleophilic. One can imagine attaching different molecules for a different purpose, and that's one of the things we're playing with now. Now, no one had ever done SIS on a three-dimensional thing like this before. It had always been a thin film technology. And it didn't go well the first time we tried. So the postdoc who was doing this experiment took four of those cubes of foam, and he stuck them in the reactor and ran it. And when he opened it up, there were three. And we were sure that he had counted wrong because <laughs> things don't just disappear. Um, so what we did is we positioned them near a port so we could watch what was happening during the reaction. And what you're gonna see is a short video here where uh, it has been exposed to precursor A, the trimethyl aluminum, and I don't know, four or five seconds into the video comes the water pulse. smoke clears, it's gone. <laughs> it actually did disappear. So what on earth is going on? So here we turn to uh, a little bit of science. We were able to do in situ infrared spectroscopy in this system, so we can track what's going on a little bit. So I know you can't see it all that well uh, back there, but this is the infrared spectrum of the starting foam. And here's a feature that corresponds to the NH feature of polyurethane, and here's a, one that corresponds to the uh, carbonyl groups, which are also in polyurethane. <clears throat> After you expose it to TMA, you'll notice that those two features all but disappear. Those are the functional groups in the polymer chain that are interacting with the, with the precursor, the SIS precursor. Now you can just do a back of the envelope thermodynamics calculation here. So those are exothermic reactions of TMA react consuming those groups. And if you consumed all of the available groups that you estimate are there, and no heat left the foam, of course some does leave the foam, but if none did, the temperature would rise to 2,000 degrees. Hence, it's gone. So what can you do about that? If that was the end of the story, I guess I wouldn't be telling you the story. So there are a number of strategies that allow you to get around this problem. One is you can expose it to less trimethyl aluminum, so just therefore all you need is enough to functionalize the surface so you can control your dose. Another thing you can do is to go to something like uh, zinc oxide, a different oxide precursor. It's a less exothermic reaction, and so less heat is released. Gives you more flexibility. Or you can just replace the polyurethane with a different polymer, like polyamid, which is just more thermally stable, for example, and has also a different number of functional groups that you'll be attacked. Now, for reasons that I don't really have time to explain, we use mass gain of the foam as a proxy for what you don't want to have happening, that 
uh, going up in smoke. And we define kind of an arbitrary line of masking, which we want to stay under to avoid degradation of the material. And so the normal uh, TMA with polyurethane, if you stay at a low enough exposure time, you can stay below that line. If you go to the zinc, you have a bigger processing window. And if you go to a foam like polyimid, you actually have a, a very large processing window. So any of those strategies work. And in the end, then, you take it through to the next step with the silenization, and you get a pretty nice performing oil sorbent. So on the left here is shown uh, how much capacity grams of oil per gram of sponge over time. Now, if you start with just plain old polyurethane, it will absorb some oil, five or, five or seven grams per gram, and it takes a few minutes to saturate. It's a very slow process. It'll slowly find its way into the foam. After you do this functionalization, this two-step functionalization with SIS and then the silenization, you can see that you get a huge increase in capacity, more like 30 grams per gram with this particular sponge, and it happens very, very fast, which you'll see shortly in the video. Now that 30 grams per gram, by the way, is not, uh, so that's actually fully saturating this sponge. All of the available volume inside those pores is filled with oil. So we've done other sponges that had, uh, you know, larger, uh, larger porosity, and they can go higher. So we've gotten up to 90, for example, by doing it that way. I mean, in terms of uh, selectivity, you can see the untreated polyurethane actually takes up more water than oil, and then it becomes highly oleophilic after the treatment. This works with a number of different types of oil, much to our surprise, because we weren't intending to target all types of oil necessarily. Um, but it works with crude oil, which is the one you care about in this case. This, by the way, is really hard to get your hands on crude oil. I was surprised to find out. You can't just buy a gallon of crude oil. We tried. Um, you can buy a million gallons of crude oil, but you can't buy one gallon of crude oil. Uh, we did eventually get some, obviously. Um, there's also a refined oil there, and then there's a totally different type of thing, a silicone oil, it even works with that. Now, I mentioned that reusability is a key feature in such a sorbent, otherwise, what's the point? And here you're seeing through six cycles that it just maintains the same capacity uh, through reuse over and over again. So, videos are more compelling than graphs. So this is a, a demonstration of a, a little chunk of what we now call oleo sponge. So there it is. And that blue stuff is oil. We just dyed it to make it easier to see because oil and water look kind of similar. And here's an oil spill. Not a very big one, but it's an oil spill. And you'll see what the oleo sponge can do. So it's fast, and it's only grabbing the oil. And remember I mentioned you want to be able to recover the oil. There's value in that, right? It's a commodity. So you can actually recover the oil just by squeezing it. And then you can reuse the sorbent. You can just keep doing that. You also notice when he shakes it around, it does not shed oil into the water, which is another important uh, property. So I, I haven't counted. I actually don't know how many cycles there are in this particular video, but we have yet to find a point at which the performance degrades. So I think we've done it 20 or 30 times in a cycle with no, no drop in performance. I don't know what the limit is. Presumably there is some point at which it wouldn't work anymore, but it's, it's a lot of cycles. So we were excited when we got to that level, but of course we're talking about cleaning up oil spills that are bigger than a little puddle in a, in a crystallization dish in the lab. <clears throat> and so we needed to scale this up. And uh, what I'll show you next is that same demonstration done at uh, a scale that is now this large instead of this large. So that is a pad made filled with the oleo sponge, and it's in some netting to hold it together. <coughs> Here's some more blue oil. Now he's pouring in, I don't know, probably half a gallon or so of oil. Interestingly enough, this is a carnival dunk tank that we're using here. <laughs> that was really hard to get through procurement. <laughs> uh, check this out. And just like the little guy, you can squeeze out that oil and reuse it over and over and over again. So we are convinced that this is an effective way to clean up surface oil slicks. But as I mentioned, that is not the task that the Coast Guard gave us. What they wanted us to, because there are solutions, albeit them not very good ones for cleaning up surface oil today, like I said, usually burning. There's no technology that can get it out of the water column. And so the question is, would this thing work down under the surface of the water 
in seawater with you know, an emulsion of oil droplets. That's a very different physical challenge than what we're facing. You've got to break that emulsion, the surface tension, and all that other kind of stuff that goes on there. So we weren't able to test that at Argonne, because we don't have the facilities to do that. So we actually came not too far from here, uh, Naval Station Earl, uh, on the <coughs> Jersey coast. Uh, has a facility within its bounds, which is actually not owned by the Navy, but owned by uh, the Department of Interior, called uh, OMSET, and it's huge. This is the largest uh, uh, oil spill tank in the world. So that's uh, roughly two football fields long. It holds like two and a half million gallons of seawater, uh, eight or nine feet deep. And it has on it these two uh, bridges, which are actually mobile. They can move up and down the tank. And this facility is used for oil spill training and, and response for the most part. So we made a trip out there almost exactly a year ago. In fact, I think it was exactly a year ago that we were there uh, to test out our oleo sponge for underwater performance. So we spent a whole week there, outdoors in Jersey in December. It wasn't quite this cold, but it was cold. So this is a pretty harsh environment to be exposing your material to. This is a frame that's, I don't know, about nine foot by nine foot metal frame, which is going to hold pads of the oleo sponge. That's canola oil, which you picked up at Costco on the way. It turns out that this sponge needs to be exposed to pure oil before you expose it to oil and water, and then you squeeze all that oil out. It has to do with the kinetics of that initial wetting. Um, that's it. That's postdoc. So here we've got this wall. This is a 10,000 time scale up from that cube that we started with. That is under the surface of the water now, in the seawater, and that is Alaska North Slope crude oil coming out under the surface as a cloud of oil droplets, microscopic oil droplets, and encountering this wall of oleo sponge. And in fact, that wall included not just oleo sponge, but some benchmark materials as well. We had untreated polyurethane, we had commercial polypropylene sorbent, we had polyimid based oleo sponge, and so on. So after a while of being exposed to that mixture, you pull it out and you run it through the ringer, literally, and squeeze out the fluid. And there's gonna be some water, of course, because this thing was submerged under the water for, in fact, overnight before it ever saw any oil. But you can see there is, in fact, oil that we pulled out of the water column this way. So this, to our knowledge, is the first example of anyone pulling out uh, uh, clouds of crude oil droplets from the water column. I don't have the... Uh, the page numbers yet, but in the next issue of uh, this journal are the quantitative results to show it to you. Suffice it to say it worked, uh, and it vastly outperformed all of those benchmark materials that we compared it to in terms of capacity, selectivity for oil versus water, and reusability. Um, and interestingly, we also, not only do we test at several different crude oils, because not every crude oil is unique, there are, it's a blend of you know, dozens or hundreds of different chemicals, so Everyone's going to be different. We used one from the Gulf, we used one from Alaska. Works with both of those. And we also did diesel fuel, highly processed. And interestingly enough, when we were doing the test with the diesel fuel, no, and it was the same pads, by the way, used over and over and over again to speak to reusability. Um, uh, so when we did the test with the diesel fuel and we wrung out the fluid, we thought it didn't work because it looked like water. Um, but it turns out when you actually did the analysis, it worked beautifully. It worked just as well with diesel fuel as it did with um, the crude oil. That's important for things like ports and harbors where you often have uh, diesel fuel spills. Um, turns out this can attack those as well. So because the video was compelling, this is one of those stories that, uh, that went viral and got picked up by uh, most of the major media outlets. But um, my fiance was unimpressed by this. Because um, she said it's not really a big deal in science until George Takei uh, puts it onto uh, his blog. And it was like that week, George Takei put it on his blog. So finally got the respect from, the, from my fiance for this one. So let me just mention the folks who uh, did this work. So the people in the left column are, are students and postdocs. Uh, uh, Ed is the primary postdoc who did the oleo sponge stuff. He's now a staff member at Argonne. And work with us on these things. Uh, Anna was the uh, photocatalytic membranes. Ruben's a fantastic graduate student from the University of Chicago who's doing the isoporous stuff. Hopkins a postdoc working on membranes. Jeff is my colleague at Argonne, co-inventor of SIS, and he's a world expert in atomic layer deposition and, and SIS. 
Uh, so he's worked with me on uh, just about everything I showed you. Next two guys are scientists and engineers in his lab. Uh, Paul Neely is a professor at the University of Chicago who co-supervises uh, Ruben. And Professor Zhu from uh, Zhejiang University uh, is a collaborator of ours on um, that uh, photo Fenton photo catalyst that I showed you. Those are the folks who um, have paid for this work. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Questions for Seth? There are microphones. Let me ask you a silly question, or if you've got somebody else. Oh, wait. Wait for the microphone. Somebody has the microphone. Who has the microphone? The floor is yours. On um, what what would be the cost, like dollars per square meter of this a sponge like this? Yeah, so we've we've tried to project that. Although the, I'll tell you why this projection is hard. So first, let me tell you the answer that we came up with using the same manufacturing techniques that we're using. We estimate that it would be like two to four dollars for a one meter long strand of this stuff. Which, if you factor in the the reusability. Then if you want to say like what is, how many dollars are you spending per gallon of oil cleaned up, you know, it goes up, you know, the cost is very, very low compared to a traditional sorbent. That said, I don't think that number actually means anything because you wouldn't make it, you wouldn't manufacture it the way that we're making it. We're making it this way because that's the tools that we have in our laboratory, which are batch-based processes, and they're ALD, it's actually atomic layer deposition equipment we're using for this SIS step. You don't need vacuum at all to do this. You just need uh, a dry environment. And one could do this on a roll-to-roll -roll continuous process um, in, you know, a nitrogen jacket, basically. And you can imagine the cost dropping through the floor uh, to manufacture this stuff. And we're actually, so when, when a place like Argonne develops technology, you know, we buy all intellectual property if we think it's useful. And then, you know, usually we have to go out and try and pitch it to people and get their interest. Because this thing went so viral with the videos, we've had, I don't know, three or four hundred uh, inquiries from the private sector looking to work with us on this. And, um, you know, we're hopefully narrowing down to, to some partners who can help us get to the manufacturing too. Yeah. Ah. Well, you gave us some examples of major oil spills in the beginning of your talk, and in a sense, you've partially <laughs> answered my question, but how many square meters or square kilometers of your film do you need? Yeah. And presumably you're going to have to propel it through the water in right. some way. Yeah, thank you, actually. And that really is, it seems to me problematic, but a challenge. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so uh, let me describe how we envision it being used. Yeah. Um, so first of all, when you have an oil spill in a body of water, time is your enemy. That oil is spreading, you know, currents and whatever, just diffusion, it's just moving around. And uh, all the time it's there, it's of course causing damage to the life form. And so the fact, you need to get to it as quickly as possible. Um, and so for this kind of stuff, we envision having it warehoused in areas where there's oil and gas operations, so it's already um, near the site. Uh, one can even use it as a preventive measure. You could then line uh, you know, the verticals in a, in a deep water platform with the sponge to capture small spills before they ever even get out into the, the broader environment. But um, this, it begs the question of how would you use this to clean up oil in the water column out and so I'll tell you what our vision is, but you know this is very far from, I'm a, I'm a material science guy, this is uh, not my area of expertise, but it's what we're proposing. So when there's a big oil spill like Deepwater Horizon, there's already a big federal program where they bring fishing trawlers, commercial fishing trawlers, to the scene. And what they're there for is to tow those booms that uh, corral the oil and try and make it thicker so you can skim it. Or, or so it. they can be made of your sponge and so, so in, well, instead of So our main focus, again, is oil on the water, yeah. not oil on the surface. And what fishing trawlers do is normally, when they're not cleaning up the oil spills, they're fishing with nets <laughs> under the surface of the water. So our vision is you just have a net that has oleo sponge integrated with it, and they fish. But they're pulling oil out of the water column, you winch it on the boat, compress it out, and make another one. OK. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a, a really elucidating talk. Uh, questions are, uh, implied by a lot of the stuff you've talked about, but 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 not directly addressed. And, and it's a question of sort of membrane lifetime, and and what's a reasonable engineering target? Can it can a membrane last forever in 
a uh, uh, in a varied environment. So uh, this is coming from a battery point of view. So 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 after electrodes die, then then you look at the membrane. Um, they clog up, uh, particularly when they're air breathing. They become filled with carbonates. So so is there a pathway with methods like this to have something that is you know, truly the Teflon and the way we talk about Teflon where, where it will not change or, or do we have to sort of say 15 years, 20 years, whatever yeah, it is? I don't think infinite lifetime is realistic. Sure. Um, so there, you can follow these parallel strategies of making an interface less likely to foul in the first place or be degraded by something in the first place, but that has limits. It's not going to prevent it forever. It just extends its lifetime that way. And then you can also have these strategies to be active self-cleaning, like the yep. photocatalysis I showed as an example. Now, that will work, but there are limitations. Most of these membranes are polymeric. And that catalytic activity will eventually be you know, self-inflicted on the membrane. Now, it's of course going to work on the fallon first, but over time, you can imagine if you do enough of that, you're going to degrade the membrane with sure. the catalytic function that you're using to clean it. So, so, so not to... So if, if somehow you were able to make the membrane out of something that had a, you know, a, 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 a lower thermodynamic state, like alumina or titania, mm -hmm. then would such a strategy be yeah. potentially so, infinite? Yeah, so, so people, there are companies out there that make ceramic membranes. Right. Saw it, yeah, yeah. Membranes. And some of them are getting flexible or at least yeah. mechanically um, tougher. And so those, their lifetime is way higher already yeah. for ceramic membranes with no yeah. fancy tricks like we're playing here. Um, they also cost a lot more, and so it all comes down into sure. okay. your life cycle economic yeah. analysis, whether it makes sense to use this or not. I think they are gaining market share, those ceramic membranes, for this reason. The membrane stability is a huge problem, um, and we can make it even better uh, yeah. using right. like this. Sure. either ceramic or polymer. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, just a quick one. How selective is the oleo sponge relative to, uh, say, smaller hydrocarbon or natural organic matter? Yeah, we haven't done that test yet. It's a great question. Um, so, well, crude oil has some of that in it, um, but it's all mixed up at the soup. So we haven't done a separate analysis with, you know, polyamine or, you know, just some make your small molecule. Um, it's a great question. I don't know uh, how well it would work, and we should test that. And if you know a sponsor who's willing to fund us to do the experiment, we'd love to hear. Um, so surfactants, either industrial or natural, serve to you know, coat droplets of oil and make them not look oily. Um, so do you find that um, the sponge doesn't work on material that's already been treated or been out in the wild for a long time? Great question. Uh, so you've hit on another thing that we haven't tested yet, and that's actually a re that's on our radar, one of the really important things we need to test, because especially since those persons are being used, you know, now you're introducing a lot of surfactants into the environment, and how will that affect the selectivity? I don't know the answer. It's a great question. I mean, our hope is that technologies like this will push their factors out of that the oil spill response community so that they wouldn't use it anymore because you have a better option. So then it would become an irrelevant point for that particular application. Now there are other applications, I'm sure a bunch of smart people could probably put a lot of other ways this could be used. One would be, for example, in the uh, producer flowback water you get in the hydraulic fracturing environments. Those things produce more water than they do oil. Um, and then lots of stuff in that water, including oil. And so you want to clean it up and separate it, but there's also, you know, those fracking fluids have a lot of surfactants in them, so there it becomes relevant to it. It's an important question, but I don't know. Any other questions for Sam? If not, please join me in thanking him for an inspiring